Hello, and welcome to Piano Tech Radio Hour, the weekly bridge to the future of the Piano Tech community. I'm David Anderson. And I'm Ethan Janney. And we're here to ask great questions, and then we'll shut up and listen to some of the authorities, experts, and most outstanding personalities in our little world of pianos. So, put on your best set of headphones, and let's get started. Should be out there on the socials on facebook and youtube hello everyone and soon we'll let our participants into the zoom call here they are here they come all right welcome everyone uh welcome to piano tech radio hour good to have you here um we'll, we'll as we always do we'll spend just a minute or two letting people get settled and letting the stragglers join um, then I'll start to introduce the program and our guests today. Uh, I'm excited for this one. Got a hometown hero, I'll say. I don't know. <laughs> From the New York area. <laughs> um, one of our colleagues uh, that we're getting to know a little bit better out there. And uh, yeah, sounds good. So, you know, it looks like we've got the majority of probably the folks that are joining on Zoom hopped in. So there'll be a few people that um, join us as well. We'll put a link in Facebook and YouTube and that link will allow you to join the Zoom directly. We encourage you to do that. Um, we may or may not jump off the live stream early, but and then continue the Zoom call. So you want to be a part of the action in here. Um, I will start to give an intro to the program then and introduce our guests and the topics for today. And we'll get rolling. Thanks, everyone, for being here. I will say welcome to Piano Tech Radio Hour. You know, we gather here every Saturday. We meet with and learn from the most fascinating and knowledgeable folks in the piano world. This could include manufacturers, rebuilders, musicians, makers of other instruments, all sorts of folks. And this includes, of course, piano technicians. Our mutual goal is to become better at a craft to help each other and to create an ever more musical world together. Piano Tech Radio Hour is brought to you by Piano Technicians Masterclasses. It's an online learning resource that brings you cutting edge instruction from piano industry masters without leaving your home. You can find out more on pianotechniciansmasterclass.com. You can also subscribe to Radio Hour for just $16 a month. You can get direct access to each week's private Zoom call, as well as the archival recordings of, I think we're at around 190 episodes in our member area, doing this for a couple of years now. Um, you can join Pianotech Radio Hour and subscribe at bit.ly forward slash join PTRH. That's bit.ly forward slash join PTRH. Um, we're also going to put into the chat here uh, a couple of things that are going on right now. Um, we've got a, a really awesome uh, masterclass coming up on the 15th of February, just in a few days, with Ken Walkup, a, a veteran master of the piano industry himself. He'll be discussing the history of the piano action from the Baroque area to the 20th century. Masterclass, again, is on... 15th of February, 6 p.m. Pacific, uh, sorry, I'm reversing that, uh, 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern Time, and you can find out more at this link that we're putting in the chat. Uh, I guess I'll say it, it's a little bit awkward. Pianotechnicismasterclass.com forward slash Ken dash walkup for, uh, uh, sorry, Ken dash walkup dash 2024. We'll have to get a short link for that together. <laughs> um, and then uh, we'll get started here. Let me introduce our guest, and then Emrys also uh, remember to let people in from the waiting room as they join. I'm seeing a couple people jumping in now. Good to see you all. Uh, let's introduce today's guest. <clears throat> this is Itzak. It's spelled Isaac, I S A A C. And we all like, I don't know, people, some people say Isaac. Like I, I enjoy saying it appropriately because I know you say Itzak. <laughs> um, Itzak, you're taking the first. Itzak. Isaac, yeah. is that it? Okay, great. Yeah. Either depends on what I side of the like, family you're on. Yeah. Now the last name, I don't know that I know how you say it. I'm going to give a stab at it. Namias. Uh, very close. Namias. Namias. Okay, so yeah. Isaac, Namias. That's correct. Awesome. Fun to say. Um, let's get a bio on Isaac. Uh, after graduating from Indiana University, where he studied jazz pedagogy at the Jacob School of Music under the late iconic 
David Baker, Isaac moved to New York to pursue his passion, playing and studying piano in the Mecca of Music. Soon after, he began apprenticing with craftsman Brian Whiten, who's also been on the show from Big Wrench Piano Care. Uh, Isaac worked, or sorry, Isaac worked closely with him and other technicians to learn how to rebuild and tune pianos. He then had the opportunity to work for the legendary Steinway and Sons Company, where he learned more about piano rebuilding from a tradition of multi-generational artisans and did some piano sales and consulting as well. As a pianist, a piano teacher, and piano tuner, he wanted to create an outlet in Brooklyn, New York, for those who are seeking risk-free, reliable, and beautiful pianos. Uh, Isaac's store, Prosper Pianos, is a culmination of a lifelong dream and love affair with music. The company is named after his father, Prosper Namias, who changed the course of his life when he bought the family a piano. Isaac is now proud to be a part of that process for others. Hey, I have to say, before I say welcome, similarly, my mom, you know, I remember she invested in this really awesome upright piano, put a lot of energy and thought into purchasing it, got great advisement on it, and, you know, probably spent, you know, way more than she had budgeted for something like that. I still got that piano today, changed the course of my life as well. So I appreciate you mentioning that. Um, Isaac, welcome to uh, Piano Tech Radio Hour. Thank you, Ethan. Glad to be here. My pleasure. Um, yeah, and I'll just say, you know, um, I, I lived in New York uh, several years ago for for about a decade and founded the Floating Piano Factory. And since then, I've kind of been moving around. We met like a few times back in the day as you were kind of getting rolling in the area, um, but didn't connect that much until maybe the past year or so. We started doing some collaborations and, you know, things have been going really well. Uh, a stand-up guy um, that can then, you know, help you out in a pinch. And so that's been really cool. And we're learning some things from each other. So um, I would love to get a little bit of your background here. We you mentioned you went to, you did your education at Indiana University, studied jazz. I've heard you play. It's really great. Uh, you're a really talented musician as well. Um, tell me a little bit more about that journey and maybe like, I know it's always a big decision to become a musician, to study music, and then it's a big transition to become a piano technician. So maybe you could tell us about that and address those kind of two pivotal moments. Totally. And I think it's no coincidence that where I grew up in Indianapolis, Indiana, which is where I was living prior to moving to New York, there was actually a piano dealer, piano restorer that lived, that had his business maybe two blocks away from my house. And it was also across the street from the Jazz Kitchen, which is the maybe the major jazz club in Indianapolis. And I have so many memories kind of spending time in between both places, whether it was getting into the jazz club to hear the music, pretending like I was 21. We'll um, let that slide, hopefully, for the musicians that were eager to get in before they were allowed to. And yeah, I spent a ton of time at that piano store. Now, as a kid, I had no interest in being in the rebuilding shop. It was dusty. <laughs> Um, the guys seemed kind of cranky and I really was in the showroom playing the pianos, annoying the heck I'm sure out of the sales team there. And yeah, so I don't know. I always like looking back and knowing that there was kind of like the shadow of piano technology was always sort of there looming in the background. And I remember having the piano tuners over to my house and certainly sitting there, listening to the tuning, asking a few questions, always having kind of like a vague fascination with it, but not really getting involved in piano technology until about 11 years ago. But prior to that point, my whole life was studying piano. And a big part of that journey was coming out to New York to study with different piano teachers. Um, because my father is French, we actually lived in France for about the first seven years of my life. And I was spending some time going out to visit him when he was living in France. And so I would stop in New York and take some piano lessons. And take an opportunity to go to the jazz clubs in New York, open up a copy of like the village voice and see who that used to be in Miles Davis's band is still alive and well and playing music. And Oh my gosh, I can go out and hear them tonight. So yeah, initially my draw to New York was definitely focused on coming out here to play music, to be a part of the music and kind of continue in that uh, tradition. And I remember when I was 14, there was a performance at the jazz kitchen it featured uh, someone who became a teacher and a mentor of mine, a guy named Dan Tepfer, who's a phenomenal jazz piano player, classical pianist. 
And I remember being in the back of that club and I can't even tell you what tune it was, but I just remember feeling like an overwhelming uh, sense of ecstasy just kind of flowing through my body and I felt so connected and I knew that even if I would be poor the rest of my life, if I could just continue being a part of music, that that would be like my greatest joy. Um, and yeah, that uh, kind of moment really fueled me to practice harder. Eventually, it led to me uh, applying to go to music school, getting into Indiana University, and ultimately kind of led me out to New York. Um, so that was sort of my journey in music. And what so I you actually let me yeah. get this straight. So you did have some experiences in New York before you actually went to Indiana University. OK, I didn't realize that. OK, I very did. cool. I probably had no business being out here in those years, but I somehow uh, managed to stay at like a youth hostel in Times Square and I would take the train to Brooklyn. And yeah, it was all super exciting and inspiring for me back then. Yeah, that sounds like quite an adventure. Yeah. Uh, um. So you went out to Indiana University, you got to study with David Baker, whose name is, uh, I, I think he was the one who would make those like music minus one type of things, right? So that's that's one of the ways he got super famous. It's kind of the backup band for your practicing and stuff like that, right? Yeah, exactly. The play alongs. And yeah, I mean, David Baker was actually in New York City the day that Kind of Blue was recorded and like got to have a conversation with Bill Evans, you know? Wow you know, and Coltrane. And he was definitely a big part of the culture before he moved to Indiana. And I think, I'm not sure, but maybe started the first Colligate Jazz program. Um, mm -hmm. whatever that was. Yeah, yeah, definitely an icon in, in education. So that's a really great opportunity. Um, yeah, and in, in Indianapolis, not far from where I am in the Chicago area. So right. you've got a similar Midwestern experience. Um, so we'd love to talk about um, I mean, we, we kind of touched upon, um, you know, where you you, you kind of got into the piano industry and you worked with Brian White in a little bit. Um, what was the what was the moment here where you got into piano technology specifically? Um, I don't think we covered that. Well, to be fair, when I was in college, I rebuilt a few Fender Rhodes pianos, like literally just through looking at YouTube videos. I think I found a book at the library. And I, yeah, just took it upon myself to to go through that journey. I had no background in engineering or construction. I spent my whole life avoiding hurting my hands, protecting my hands. So I wasn't like a, a power tools kind of guy. So it definitely was like a real left field endeavor. But um, yeah, I don't remember exactly what inspired me to do it. Um, I had that Fender Rhodes in my dorm room, took it to my first apartment sold it, bought another one, and I did that a few times in college. So when I first went and kind of walked into Brian's shop in Brooklyn, I mentioned that to him. And I think for him, that was like maybe a seed of promise. Like, okay, this guy obviously has this curiosity. You know, I didn't have a background at that time in tuning or rebuilding. I knew nothing about it. I only had my background in music. And oftentimes, I think for people in the piano technology world, they're not looking for musicians to join the team necessarily. You're looking for people that are focused. You're looking for people that are disciplined. And while these things could be mutually exclusive, I find oftentimes musicians hold those qualities. And certainly a lot of that um, mentality that I was developing as a classical pianist, as a jazz pianist, I kind of took that in with me when I was sort of exploring the idea of getting into piano technology. Ultimately, Brian uh, mentioned that somebody was leaving the shop, there was an opening, and maybe I should just give it a try. And yeah, I think that I wasn't sure what uh, it would lead to. I think when I was first giving it a shot, I was also still playing piano three nights a week in New York. I was working at a restaurant six days a week. I was a barista five mornings a week. I was a caterer. I was really doing everything I could to sustain myself. I also taught piano. Um, so yeah, I just found that amongst the, I don't know, I was playing a lot of the music gigs that weren't really about the music. They were about being in the background. And I was sort of kind of at the lowest totem pole of like live piano performance. And it sort of felt a little like spiritually demoralizing this craft, this like thing that I had been, you know, putting my heart into my whole life was sort of being capped at 75 bucks, you know, for three hours of solo piano. So I noticed that in the shop, when I was in the shop, I don't know, there was a sense of 
um, unity. There was a sense of we're all coming here together to to put ourselves into this one thing. And it was nice for the first time in my life being a solo piano player to like sort of be a part of a team. And I think that that in itself, you know, was sort of making me feel more comfortable with piano technology. And I discovered that the more I went to the shop, the more I applied myself, the more I practiced, the more I got out of it. And I quickly learned, much like studying piano, learning big, complicated pieces, piano technology is sort of, there's a craft to it, but then there's also the knowledge. And so I was really able to just jump in and you know, really dive deep into that pursuit. And yeah, I have a lot of fond memories of getting to the shop early, doing my temperament, doing my tunings. And, you know, I essentially, at some point, I just started going there every day, whether I had other kind of jobs earlier in the day, I would just always make time to get to the shop. And frankly, I was driven by the knowledge. I was driven by, yeah, assimilating these new concepts. And then, of course, I understood that it was about experience and that I needed to do that concept over and over and over again to have a better grasp on that mastery, proficiency, efficiency. So yeah, I just found a lot of crossover with the mindset that I had as a piano player in that shop. So it kind of, I think, crept up on me really to answer your question. Like when I knew I was going to be pursuing the path of being a piano technician, I think that, yeah, I just kept doing it and it just kept rewarding me. And it kind of brought me all the way up to the point that I've landed at today. Um, cool. My yeah. retail shop and my retail tuning business and whatnot. Yeah. As with a lot of the stories that we come across, um, there's a certain magnetism for the folks that end up in the industry, you know, and we've had, a, you know, folks that uh, went off to business school and thought they were going to, you know, and then oh, they're back in the piano industry <laughs> uh, for the, for those that fit uh, it kind of attracts and, and sort of, rewards uh reinvestment um and I can't understate that you know how inspired i was by brian by his professionalism by his dedication to the craft by his like yeah deep deep love and knowledge of pianos you know i wanted to align myself with that and you know it really took somebody that i had was able to look up to to for me to able to kind of climb that ladder uh per se and certainly had a lot of other mentors i ran into a big one that comes to mind is dan levitan <laughs> He's been an invaluable, humble source of information. I feel like his book, The Craft of Piano Tuning, explained piano tuning to me in a way that I wasn't getting and kind of helped me get to the next level. Um, and yeah, technicians like that have yeah been all around me. New York has been a great source of inspiration, whether it's through the guild or just through meeting different people in the field and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. New York, uh, you know, I... I wasn't that involved in the guild when i was in the chicago area for whatever reason i had met up a few times with a couple of guys and um but i remember coming to new york and getting involved in the guild meetings and you know it, it, it's 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 a very cool vibe in new york especially you know it's just like the people are at a, at a higher level of the game there's there's more people at the meetings um more engagement more people that have interesting specialties to share about um, it was def it's definitely a special place in terms of uh, being a member of the guild and, and interacting with the community there for sure. Totally. Um, so, all right, let's move on to Steinway, and then of course I think we want to spend probably a majority of the time. It, it you know it seems like you've got some interesting things to share about kind of your philosophy of sales, but talking about your experience at Steinway will probably be be a good transition so how did that all happen did 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 you just get a call oh Steinway's looking for someone or did you just like call them and show up and see if they needed a, a position or you know how did that all come together yeah great question that would have been nice a phone call i would have taken that call for sure <laughs> but sadly that was not the case it was a very long uphill battle um i applied over at steinway because i had a friend of a friend who was working there both as a technician and I had another friend of a friend working there in sales. So I knew a few faces, though I wouldn't say I had like an N by any means. And Brian's shop was transitioning. We, it was unclear whether he was going to move to a new location, whether he was going to close up shop and move into another type of business. So I was looking for employment. So I just applied. I emailed them. I went through the website. Uh, they oftentimes have job postings at a certain section of their site. 
And I definitely reached out to my friends and I said, hey, you know, if you can by any chance mention that my resume is coming through, you know, that'd be great. I think, you know, I'd be a great candidate and I'd love to have a talk with whoever's involved. And I definitely in the interview process, I keep an attitude of not will you have me, but more so here's why I think I would be a great fit. And I think that's a mindset thing where, you know, I want the company to know I think I have something of value to give them. And ultimately, I ended up doing, I think, three or four different interviews over the course of, like I said, three to four months. So, yeah, I had no idea I was going to get the job, but I eventually got the job. And certainly I had people like Brian. I had a few colleagues or musician friends like Jason Moran, who wrote me letters of recommendation. Dan Tepfer served as a reference for me. So a lot of these musicians and people that I met along the way really went to bat for me during that like interview process. And I'm sure that their referrals, you know, meant just as much as everything I was trying to communicate in the interview process. Um, but definitely was a little uh, mentally, you know, and spiritually fraught, you know, just that whole period of time not knowing, will I make it? What should I start applying at other places? And to be fair, I actually did apply at two or three other piano companies in New York City, and I was offered jobs, but I was just holding out for Steinway. It's where I wanted to work. I spent my whole life listening to records recorded on Steinways, uh, listening to musicians that play on Steinways. So there's definitely something about the company mystically that was like drawing me there. Um, so I kind of put all my eggs in one basket after a certain point. And yeah, eventually I got the call, the call saying, yes, we would like to have you. And I kind of started my journey there. Initially, I was supposed to be a piano technician and go down that route. And they ultimately decided or offered me an opportunity to get into sales. And that was kind of a total shift. I knew that while I was working at the smaller shop with Brian, I definitely had a knack for talking to people. I don't know if it was my experience in the service industry, my experience as a solo piano player, just constantly talking to different people. But I definitely love talking about the work. I get really passionate about talking about um piano concepts. And I love explaining difficult ideas in simple ways, metaphorically or just broken down. Um, so yeah, I decided they also said I would make more money. <laughs> and you know, you have to understand being a musician kind of broke your whole life when someone says, Oh, we have another job for you, you'll do way better, you'll make way more money. You know, it kind of was a little alluring. So um, yeah, I went down the road of sales. And Gosh, I, I learned a lot. I mean, you know, like I mentioned, I was bringing a lot to the table, but I had a lot to learn. Um, let's see. I'm going to kind of check in with some of my notes. Um, sure. And actually, I'll use this opportunity to say um, for if you're out there on Facebook and YouTube, this is a point where we're going to sign off from the stream that's going out to the public. Um, and then if you would like to continue the conversation, if you're watching live, go ahead and click the link that we'll put in the chat and jump here on the Zoom call with us, and you can stick around a little bit. And um, if you can't do that right now, or you're catching this limited recording at a later date, uh, sign up for Piano Tech Radio Hour, and uh, you can catch the recording in our member area. But uh, yeah, we'll move on, having said that, um, into this process. Um, I'll just make a few comments, though. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, I've just run into it over and over again, having been involved in bunch of different businesses of course this is a business that i'm endeavor and the photo piano factory more is kind of like the sort of business person running it and then uh a startup that i've been involved in for the past few years you start to see the pattern uh typically a sales people make more <laughs> because it's very I, I mean it's easier to connect the fact that revenue is coming in to them uh, because they're the, that pivotal point where the sales made. Um, and so, yeah, that is kind of a recurring pattern. Uh, I, I think that people outside of sales don't always get it. Uh, but from a business perspective, it always, uh, it's an easier argument to make than other, other parts of the business. Um, so I that makes sense. In my opinion, from a physical, from a, uh, a physiological, uh, not a physiological, from a ph philosophical standpoint, yes, I think that the craft and the work and the execution and the rebuilding is in essence like the heart and soul of the endeavor if the endeavor is rebuilding to eventually sell but from a practical standpoint from a human standpoint from a resource standpoint we cannot continue to rebuild pianos if we do not sell the ones that are there 
So in essence, there has to be like a shift from phase one to phase two, where the selling of the pianos should get as much attention, as much passion, and as much focus as we put into rebuilding the pianos. And we'll go more into that um, yeah. in a moment. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I think you'll share some of your philosophy, but um, it just calls to mind that, uh, you know, there's a couple of parts to what selling means. I think for the folks that are uncomfortable with it, for the folks that kind of just want to do the work, um, it feels like uh, cajoling or convincing, you know, and if there's certainly an aspect of it that is simply just letting people know. <laughs> um, and and sort of th I think that helps assuage some people's fears. You know, it's, it's really just about, hey, listen, you made this beautiful piano or rebuilt it or you have these skills. Nobody knows about it. You're not going to be able to apply them. Um, and then, you know, there's that other level of just educating people, you know, at its simplest level, you know, the, the counter uh, uh, sort of perspective on sales uh, from being some sort of like convincing or cajoling is really just kind of awareness and education. <laughs> um, and you probably will touch on that a little bit, of course, but I um, oh, would yeah. love to kind of hear. Yeah, you, you said you had some notes of, I won't direct it at this point. I'm curious, like what might be some things that you, you'd like to start the conversation with uh, up in this sort of realm of sales? Totally. And I will, I guess I'll go into that with some of the notes that I wrote down that some ideas that came to me from my time at Steinway in the sales training uh, space. I noticed that there was a fierce attention to details uh, that might be what I'm writing, how, what the, the emails that I'm writing clients, they're, uh, their length, uh, grammatically correct, you know, putting a lot of attention to detail to very professional, formal, written email practice. Um, that was a big aspect of my training there. Uh, consistency, um, that's a huge one that ripples all around my sales philosophy. Um, uh, meaningful showcases and pride, meaning how you present the piano, how it's seen, the space, is it clean in your space? Is it a warm, inviting space? Um, are you, do you have pride in what you're communicating? Do you love what you're selling? You know, how is that coming through? Um, and yeah, I just wrote down being concise. I think that there's a lot of value in distilling your message down to its essential components, both for clarity's sake and for respect of the person listening to you. You know, sometimes it's nice to hear somebody talk, but, you know, when it comes to transmitting information, being concise and simple is always more effective than over talking, giving too many details, giving too much depth. Um, and then following up, that is like the biggest aspect. It's not about in baseball. It's not about the, you know, the the things that you miss, but it's about, you know, taking the second swing, taking the third swing. Um, if you just quit after your first swing, you're never going to hit anything, right? Uh, unless you're, you know, you're hitting it on the first try, which not all of us can do. Um, but yeah, I guess I'll sort of jump from there kind of into some of my notes on sales and I'll kind of go a little bit deeper into this. Mm -hmm. Um, I did Actually, well, let me yeah, walk us back. Walk us back a little bit, um, sure. just to give some even more context. Because right now, I know this, but I don't think we got this information to mm. the audience. You're sitting in your, uh, you know, studio that for selling pianos, I and know. we, we kind of skipped over that a little bit. So you work yeah. with Steinway for a bit. You learned uh, a lot. You ended up leaving the company um, yeah. and sort of working on your own independently a little bit more. Um, maybe just give a, a quick overview of what your current, you know, maybe how that started and, and the current state of affairs of what are you doing with pianos now and, and sort of especially the sales perspective. Yes. Yeah, so when I left Steinway, I was thinking I was going to relocate to Paris uh, to be closer to my family. They actually gave me an opportunity to jump in as a salesman at their new store on the Boulevard Saint Germain. Very fancy, beautiful neighborhood in Paris. And I was really exploring that and I was making plans to leave New York. But while this is happening, a really close friend of mine, he said, hey, um, maybe you shouldn't leave. Maybe there's like something here for you, meaning he had this idea that I should start a piano store, that I should do a retail store. And the reason why he had that idea is because the way we met right before I got the job at Steinway, I started experimenting with 
getting pianos on Craigslist that were free, literally free, putting them in a storage unit and just working on them. And I was reselling these pianos for $500, $400. And if you're in the New York market and you're hearing this right now, you know $400 is what you might pay just to move the piano or maybe mm -hmm. in some repairs. So it was a real experiment and it was me getting my chops up. Worth mentioning that my time before Steinway was focused on piano rebuilding. When I worked with Brian, all I did was rebuild pianos with him. So before I really got deep into the field as a piano tuner, I had a very solid understanding of how pianos work, how to regulate, how to rebuild different aspects of belly work, different aspects of bridge work. Um, I'm not saying I was a master, but I was definitely familiar with those concepts. And that really boosted me getting into tuning later. But long story short is that out of that storage unit over the course of like 12 months, I somehow sold 40 pianos, you know, and I was selling them to millionaires, people with very nice properties you know i would polish the pianos tune regulate them and granted they were free and granted some of them may have only had 10 years left or 20 years left to be in prime shape but you know i did what i could to bring value to those pianos have a more than fair exchange and yeah it was definitely the uh you know what the seeds that would lead to my store so basically i met my friend in this context he came to the storage unit once he bought a a 1982 Mason Hamlin upright model 50, uh, I think model E 50 from me. And that kind of started our friendship. He became a piano student of mine. And yeah, when I told him I was leaving New York, he got concerned. He was like, no, I think that you have something to offer the community. I think that if we were to go into business together, we could do something great. Um, so Waylon and I, Waylon Roche, started Prosper Pianos. Uh, worth mentioning that Waylon has since left the company. Um, he uh, came into some good fortune in the crypto space and is now uh, living a beautiful life in upstate New York. And we're still close friends, but I've sort of now carried the torch um, of the company on my own. And yeah, that is when, so he and I found a loft um, in Brooklyn, New York. And there's not a lot of these left, but back in the day, Brooklyn was full of warehouses. Probably worth mentioning that 100 years ago, Brooklyn had, I think, 30 different piano makers all throughout the borough. So there is a rich tradition of piano rebuilding, um, as we all know, in New York City, more than just Steinway and Sons. And yeah, we thought that we could kind of tap into that spirit and that we could put together not just a space where we're selling rebuilt pianos or refurbished pianos, but a space that felt really good. And what I mean by that is my space has floor to ceiling windows. Um, it's on the second floor, so you get a little bit of the skyline view in New York City. And, you know, I don't have like uh, corporate policies or corporate aesthetics. I can make the store look any way I want. So I'm really big into dried flowers and uh, different, you know, floral elements. And I deconstructed a baby grand and I hung the harp from the ceiling and yeah, I try to create a really creative space that makes people feel good, that inspires you, that when you walk in, uh, you get a really good feeling. Um, and yeah, the focus of the business has been like new pianos that are less than 20 years old, and then Steinway um, Grands and Uprights and Mason Hamlin Grands and Uprights. Those have been pretty focused on those brands. I found that they're the most effective pianos to restore that have a good uh, profitability and they're just, yeah, great pianos to restore. I can go uh, into more depth on that, but yeah. And I of course have a tuning leg to my business. I would say that I really got my start in tuning outside of Brian, just reaching out to musicians, offering to tune musicians, pianos. And I was already deeply entrenched in the piano playing world. So yeah, I, I, I have a big part of my business that's focused on piano tuning for recording studios for jazz musicians and i try to be a very musician focused uh piano tuning business uh though a big focus for me the last few years has been my retail store great i appreciate the context let's dive back in um you know yeah. back to kind of like where you were at um again we can go either way if you've got some notes you want to go through around this this topic of sales i think people's ears probably perked up a little bit when you were talking. So probably excited to get back into it. And then you can let me know if you want me to kind of uh, feed you questions as well. We'll, we'll do whatever makes sense, but I'll turn it over to you now. All right, great. Well, 
I remember while I was in college, I did have the chance to take some marketing courses. I mean, I definitely had some like loose interest in marketing and just general business concepts. And, you know, one of the few takeaways from some of those business classes was whether you know it or not, you're always selling something. You're selling what you know, you're selling your past experiences, you're selling your mood. You know, there's always a sense of a sale happening. And I think the sooner we can kind of accept that, the closer we can get to being, um, I don't know, um, in our truth and get out of this convincing mentality and get more into a, I'm just telling my truth mentality or I'm sharing my knowledge. Um, so, um, yeah, I wrote down that to me, the aesthetic definition of sales is you have to have something of value that someone else may want. Um, discerning what that value is or describing it or advocating it um, or uh, oops um, so yeah there is an exchange of value and you have to you know um, describe that value you have to advocate for that value so yeah just kind of diving into I kind of was asking myself openly like how do I even define sales because I don't oftentimes speak about it in such strict terms um, so I wrote down that we have to find ways to communicate our value to clients. Um, and the way that I like to start it, and I want to think about this from two perspectives. I want to focus on the perspective of piano tuners and technicians that are going into clients' homes, recording studios and venues. And we can also sort of contrast this to what it might be like in your store or if you're trying to sell a piano, et cetera. But I am trying to focus a little bit more on this idea of going into your client's home. They've just booked you for a tuning. Uh, what happens next? Um, and the way that I like to start thinking about it is when you get to the client's house, you need to be aware of what you're giving off, whether that's the way you're speaking to the client, uh, whether you're, you know, uh, the tone of your voice. Are you being polite? Are you being rushed? Are you being short? Are you being curt? Now, you might be thinking, like, these are not relevant things to the piano tuning, your attitude, the dialoguing between the clients. But frankly, like setting that tone and being aware of that tone that you're giving off is going to help bolster the trust in you as the technician. So I think the tuning has begun before you sit at the piano. The tuning begins when you walk in the house. In New York City, we like to have a tradition of, would you like me to take my shoes off? You know, noticing that they have stacks of shoes by the door, it's a good gesture to be polite. And it kind of gives you a sense that you're being aware of your surroundings. If you're aware that the shoes need to come off, what else are you going to be aware of? So you're already starting to like build this energy before the two. I have to, uh, have to cut in here with a, a relatively, you know, we often work with brand new technicians and get them out there, you know, tuning. That's kind of one of one of the things that we can support in in the in the industry and i'm recalling you know there's been a few cases and this is a common thing for a new technician to go in to a tuning and one of the first things they might say is well i'm a new tuner so i just want to <laughs> let you know uh it, you know i'm going to do my best <laughs> and, um, and it's like you have to kind of say let's exude a little bit more confidence you know absolutely it, it, yeah. in uh it, that's just one aspect of the kind of thing that you're saying but it, it's funny to see how easy it is for somebody to search for and come up with something to complain if you set them up that there might be something wrong even if you did an excellent job now you know um and and i think these other things that you mentioning as well um like you said for a lot of us don't realize i think from what i've seen that the client has a completely different experience of what piano tuning is than we do. You know, they just don't have the same information that we do. Um, and so it's hard to imagine uh, things from their perspective. Uh, but like you said, thinking about these things that they do notice and thinking about things from their perspective will help them with to, to have the most uh, positive experience of the tuning. I appreciate that. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Listen, when I was first in the field as a tuner, you wouldn't know that I was a new tuner because I was so passionate about, you know, being there, about how driven I was, how excited I was to get to work on their piano. And thank you so much for this opportunity, maybe in a more understated way. But yeah, I definitely gave the, I you know, I created a confident, 
presence, but I also knew what I knew. And I wasn't afraid in the beginning to say, hey, I actually don't know the answer to that. I'm going to check in with the team. Or that's a great question. I feel like I can give you a better answer if I have a chance to discuss this with some of the other technicians on the team and let's circle back. So I wasn't uh, overselling or I wasn't selling things that I didn't actually know, but I was really confident about the fact that I didn't know them. And that in itself also creates an environment of trust when a client can trust you to say, to share what you know and don't know, um, whatever the context is. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I really agree with that, Ethan, totally. Um, and that's something that's really hard to communicate when you're taking on new technicians and you're trying to add people to your team. I think it can be easy as employers like you and I to communicate uh, regulation steps, uh, proper uh, action, uh, you know, disassembly techniques. But it's kind of hard to teach like interpersonal communication or like basic professional manners. It's something that we expect or hope, but it can be oftentimes hard to communicate what we're expecting out of the people on our team. And I think, yeah, starting to have these conversations about helping them build awareness of, again, setting the tone before the appointment starts. Um, and that even, by the way, starts with the email communication, um, whether that's making the communication a little bit more personal or maybe the company has sent out their stock message and maybe the technician follows up with a, hey, Ethan, uh, thanks so much for thinking of us. I'm really looking forward to checking out your piano for the first time. Um, I'll be there right at two. Let me know if you have any other issues. Here's the number to to give us a call at. So again, just kind of thinking about the visit as an opportunity to, yeah, really dig in on a deeper level and just like start creating habits of, yeah, because after a certain point it becomes thoughtless, but in the beginning it is something that you need to practice and sort of like advocate for in yourself as the technician showing up and, you know, wanting to have a more meaningful, um, and yeah, client experience. So the next You're note... giving me an interesting thing that I think is also worth mentioning. We have an interesting opportunity as piano technicians to be uh, have a fresh start so many times. You know, we get a new client um, and they we have the opportunity to work with them multiple times. It might be the first time we work with them. It might be the first time we work with someone else next time. And if you are out there and you're thinking, uh, maybe I should be presenting myself differently... <laughs> You know, you have a little bit of a um, Petri dish with each new client that you work with. You know, feel free to experiment just a little bit with how you carry yourself, how you dress, you know, what you say, how you message them and things like this. And it's really a kind of an amazing opportunity that we have the way that the business is structured to be able to experiment um, and refine that presentation. For example, I did a period of experimentation where I was only wearing like in New York City, a lot of technicians will do button up shirt, apron. Right. Very clean cut professional look. And you know what? If that makes you feel more confident, if that puts you in a good mindset, I encourage that, you know, a, apparel. But for myself, I discovered that it made me feel like I was someone I wasn't. So I, I found that just wearing a little bit more casual clothing allowed me to a little bit kind of tap into myself a little bit more. And I felt a little bit more authentic. And ultimately, that like put me in a better space um, to communicate um, with the clients and like whatnot. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I would say that for me, the next step of awareness, once you start thinking about what you are giving off, I think the next step is that you're in the client's house. And now that you've taken your shoes off and you're walking towards the piano, the tuning now we're in phase two, we still haven't opened up the piano, but we're already in phase two and phase two is making observations. And that's like a critical second step. It's happening kind of quietly. You're just looking around the house, not like you know, that's an expensive sofa, but more so like what kind of sheet music is around the piano? What genre? Is there any sheet music by the piano? I like to sometimes ask the question, uh, who's the piano player in the family? Oftentimes you get let in and it's not like necessarily clear who's playing the piano. Um, who are they studying with? I like to ask little questions about their education. You know, what uh, kind of piano music are they playing? So you can do that with your eyes, you know, and you can do that with your voice. So the observations you're making visually are going to kind of help inform things. And then you're also just asking those direct questions. And this is me maybe opening up the piano. I'm opening, I'm taking my tools out of the bag and you might only get 60 seconds. Oftentimes the client kind of gets you to the piano and then they walk away. So I feel like there's this like critical window where you can make observations, continue to build trust 
and start talking about who who tuned the piano last. What was that like? Have you had any issues of tuning stability in the past? Um, especially if this is your first time seeing a piano, you know, there's definitely a lot of great leading questions that can give you a better sense of the client's relationship to the piano. So what's happening in, in the beginning isn't just me figuring out what they know, but I'm also figuring out what they don't know. And that's going to better inform me when we get towards the end of the visit and what other technical observations I make as I'm finally getting into the piano. Um, but yeah, I would say this. So in the spirit of the observation, so I don't think you need to be a psychologist to piece together that if there's a lot of advanced piano music all around the studio, all around the piano, this is probably somebody that has a really uh, very intimate connection with their piano. It's probably somebody that would benefit from or love to have their piano regulated if they even know what that is. It's probably somebody that didn't know that they could upgrade their bass strings. It might be somebody that could tell the difference between their old strings and their new strings. So, yeah, I think that, yeah, making small little observations can be really powerful in how you approach the client towards the end of the visit. Okay, and maybe I'll, you're also going into the piano. So, yeah, I would say that moving forwards, kind of getting towards the end of the visits, now becomes like, now the tuning is over. Let's assume you did a stand-up job. You've done all your checks. You've double-checked your unisons. You've maybe even, by the way, a lot of technicians don't necessarily do this, but I'll play the piano. Not to show everybody how great my Chopin waltzes are, but to get a real genuine sense outside of my checks is their context does it actually fit all together is there a true feeling that we've you know arrived somewhere new you know after having met the piano maybe out of out of shape um once the visit is over now the visit isn't done meaning uh once the tuning is over now a new conversation starts so at this moment maybe this is a moment for you to give the client more education did you know that the keys the way they move this is because you have a ton of lost motion in your piano and did you know that if we spent just 30 minutes or an hour at the next visit or today that would go away permanently for probably the next 10 years and it's not saying you should fix the lost motion or oh did you know that the lost motion it's like having a genuine conversation like do you know that it could be this way do you know so yeah i think that using the end of the visit to start talking to the clients about what you've seen what you've observed and making genuine recommendations that feel like they're you know they're founded in your idea of you know what their expectations are for the piano you know obviously for a lot of people it's context if you see no sheet music it's just the piano a very proper clean home you get the sense that they're hiring entertainment or the piano is just not in high use maybe that's the client that you should be suggesting polishing for or a dusting service or a key cleaning you need to kind of think contextually there's no amount of time you could spend talking about lost motion that is going to make that client care so for that client you have to find what they value and that's probably aesthetics so mm -hmm. it's just yeah. on that point uh, um i had a client in new york came from a very wealthy family i for, you know lived in these one one of these great uh, condos in one of these buildings in Midtown or West Side or something, and it's a whole house in itself, but it's in a high rise. And uh, yeah, exactly that story. Uh, I try to talk about them about regulation, different stuff like that. You know, they the the music desk had a few scuffs on it, and they wanted it refinished. They would spend way more money on that. Right. to actually uh, regulate you know the piano or, or make it sound better and you know that was just the conversation you had right you could you yeah, just work you know, with what you have yeah. if these are entertainers you know there's different ways to communicate with them so maybe they know they don't play the piano maybe they don't care about the regulation but you might mention to them that the pianist that they're hiring he's going to be way more likely to want to come back he's going to be way more likely to want to continue you know sharing his talent with the family if they were to invest in properly regulating the piano it's going to mm -hmm. transform the their their entertaining experience when the piano lights when the piano player is lit up you know because the piano is feeling so good so i think ultimately there is ways to communicate that value even if it's not like readily apparent that's um, true but it is i i would say like all of my years 
teaching piano and specifically serving tables, there's this like idea of like service. I'm serving the piano students. I am serving the client food. I'm serving the client, you know, my expertise, but there's no like, uh, I think there's maybe like a sense of like, I don't serve anybody or I'm not beholden to someone, but I do think that there's something to say about like, yeah, we're, we're civil servants, meaning I'm here to give the best of my ability to that client. I'm here to uh, find out what they value and try to share that value with them to, you know, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, I, I see a little question in the chat. Um, I might as well address it. Nancy says, oh, by the way, we do have a, 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 a comment from Kevin Clem. He said he likes your website. He thinks oh. it's stunning, simple, and concise. So Thanks, Kevin. That's great feedback. Um, and then Nancy Salmon says, do us urban tuners need to advise on soundproofing, muting acoustics uh, in the room and acoustics of the neighbors? Do you have any experiences with that? So I think the question is like, do we need to or is it on us or right? And I would say, I guess it depends on the context. If there's it depends on that. I think that we could ask the question. I think that every visit is an opportunity to ask a new question. So one thing I really picked up from Dan Levitan is he keeps a physical Rolodex of all of his clients with intimate details about their kids' names, what he did on the piano, what was repaired. So he has a good sense of what's happened. I think it's really important to keep detailed notes. Mm -hmm. So if this is the second visit with that client, why not? Um, it continues to kind of show them that you are thinking about them, that whatever topics you didn't bring up last time, you're bringing up now. So I do think it could be like, yeah, a relevant thing to bring up. Um, and specific to this question, there's kind of two sides of it, soundproofing. And she was saying like the mute rail bar and things like that. One thing I kind of love about the muffler pedal on pianos, particularly when you need to install it like an aftermarket system, meaning the piano doesn't come with it and you're advocating that you, you know, would the client like this? I think that there's an element of the muffler bar that kind of gives you a Fender Rhodes, Wurlitzer kind of sound. It just kind of creates a beautiful tone. So I like to kind of also take that opportunity to say, hey, you're going to get a quieter sound, but you're also going to get a beautiful second tone um, with your piano. Normally, we only get one acoustic sound. So, yeah, I think that there's a side of it that's also just going to add more creativity, going to add more opportunity for the music maker. And yeah, do I think it's like relevance? No, but it's certainly part of the like scenario. Everybody that owns a piano is constantly thinking about, are my neighbors listening to me? Can they hear me? Am I bothering them? So is this an important question? Yes. Is it maybe like the first question on a first visit? Maybe not, but mm -hmm. definitely something that could come up on a second or third visit. Absolutely. I, I did have a client who was very, she had this little like studio plus, you know, in, in again, midtown somewhere. And, um, she was very excited to finally get like her family's piano upright in there. I came, it, it needed a string replaced and I tuned it and, um, was going to replace this string. And, but her, her so her neighbors were coming by, I guess, maybe after I left, I forget the details. Basically her neighbors complained so much just about the tuning. <laughs> that she realized she couldn't even have the piano <laughs> she's like oh, i don't replace this string i'm gonna just like move this thing out of here and figure out another way um but you definitely have to think about neighbors but the thing i think that might not also be apparent that is a really big deal is space in the big city most people don't have the space for um these larger pianos so you know it's, it's almost if you can find something that's that's space efficient for them uh it, it's something that really matters, you know, it's really helpful. Totally. So um, I'll go maybe just a few kind of last sentiments kind of like in this uh, topic. Yeah. And yeah, I would say that I mentioned it earlier, but the power of explaining something complex in a simple way, I cannot stress that enough. Like it is your duty to find a way for literally any given person and everybody needs a different approach. But it is your duty to understand the concept so masterfully, you yourself, that you could tell a child how that concept works. I think when you start to kind of look back at your knowledge and figure out how to now start communicating with clients, you know, it is, yeah, just something that you need to take time to do. And 
yeah, it's not something that's always really straightforward, but I think when you really think about what you're trying to communicate, I think eventually you can find simple ways to communicate it. And I think that that's really critical for, yeah, again, the client now trusts you to explain it to them in a simple way so that they trust you to execute something that they don't even fully understand, or at least the depth of, but they can understand the basic concept of what you're communicating. And I'm talking about pitch raises. I'm talking about... Um, uh, when a client says the key is sticky, actually the key is broken. <laughs> you know, the the key has split. You know, okay, um, yeah. So just things of things of that nature. I mean, the whole goal here is to kind of bridge our knowledge with their understanding of the knowledge, so that we can give them better service. Um, you really don't know what your client knows until you ask them. Um, I have found that like eighty percent of my retail clients have no idea that you should regulate a piano at least every decade. Like that would be like the outer limit, I think most like factories recommend. Um, and yeah, and I think it's our fault. <laughs> and I think it's on us, whether or not people want to hire us to do it, it's on us to talk about what it is, why it's important and why it can enhance their playing experience. Um, Great. We're, yeah, we are running short on time, although we can go a little bit over. Uh, one thing I just wanted, uh, at oh, least for me, this question. Up. Yeah. Follow yeah, up ahead. with all your clients. Say, hey, do you remember the conversation we had two weeks ago? I was wondering if you've given it more thought. Again, I cannot stress the importance of consistency in following up and having a long-term strategy to foster communication between you and clients. Um, yeah, go ahead, Ethan. Yeah. Um, can you give us an idea or what what's on that list of things that are more common or that you're looking for to add value for the client? You know, you kind of mentioned maybe some regulation, you know, raise the cap stands, you know, but, it, but this extends all the way to like, you might need a new piano, right? Uh, totally. That's a big deal that I know myself. I, 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 I can't sell people new piano. I mean, I, I can, I know I can in the future, but it's something I'm working on. Um, but like, Tell us about the the sort of menu of things that you're thinking of that you might educate the client about by the end of a uh, an appointment and, and maybe a little bit of the method. Well, it's there's definitely like um, it's definitely a delicate subject because there's also the con the question of value, meaning all of these suggestions you're making, would the client be better off buying a new piano? getting a free piano that's in twice as good as shape. So you kind of the for me, the value first starts at the this question of what can I add kind of begins at, well, how much do you value the piano? How much time do you spend playing it? You know, what does the piano mean to you in your life? You know, and then from there, we can kind of go into the conversation of, well, I notice your kids are playing, are getting started on piano lessons. Did you know that if we could just do some basic maintenance, it's sort of like changing the oil on your car. It's something that's never been done on your piano, I can, as far as I can tell. And I think that it, it will give your kids a much better opportunity to develop quicker um, and to get more out of their practice sessions if they could have a piano that was properly aligned. So then we just kind of always start with basics, which it would be regulation or any basic repairs that are longstanding. That would be sort of like step one. Step two might be talking about how to have a bigger impact on change and maybe talking about a new set of bass strings. Uh, we might talk about, yeah, like a polishing service. You know, I might even keep a small bit of Howard's Restore finish, some steel wool in my kit, and I will show them a sample. Don't, uh, I, I love showing clients like a little sample. So when I talk about regulation, when I talk about some of these added values that we could maybe bring on a second visit or someday, I show them. You know, it takes me a couple of seconds to quickly regulate a note, quickly do a little bit of polishing. You know, obviously I can't really sample a new bass string necessarily, but yeah, I like to just kind of show people what I mean, you know, and kind of bring them into the process. Um, but then when it comes to the bigger conversations, you need to kind of know, it, is this piano sentimental? Has this been in your family? Because if the answer is yes, this client might, there might be no amount of money that they wouldn't spend to properly restore it or refurbish it. You need to kind of delineate because when you're making recommendations, I think about bigger rebuilding projects, you have to make it very clear to the client that like on the private market, any amount of money that you put into a piano that's not a Steinway is likely not going to be worth what you put into it. So what do I mean by that? If you put 
for example, $18,000 into a restoration of a Crocker Brothers upright piano, you are not likely going to get 18 grand back from that piano um, in New York City in the marketplace that it is. I don't want to go into a deep discussion on like why that is, but just kind of having a basic sense of the market can help you advise clients on, hey, I'm happy to rebuild this piano. I'm happy to offer these services. But depending on your expectations, depending on if you want this to be an heirloom, you may benefit more from totally replacing the piano. And sometimes it's not go out and spend a lot of money. Sometimes I tell the client, I'll help you look on Craigslist to find a free piano if that's all you can afford. Because for me, when I don't sell a piano to a client, when, um, yeah, when a client needs to get a new piano, hopefully they're still taking me along on that journey. I'm still going to tune for them on their next piano or if they buy a piano from someone else. Maybe they'll still consider me to do the regulation. So there's definitely always an opportunity to kind of uh, yeah, care for the clients and show them that you're willing to kind of go the extra mile to accommodate whatever their budget is or whatever their situation is. Um, yeah. Great. Well, it sounds like we could go on forever. Uh, there's a lot to <laughs> learn uh, from Itzhak, uh, but we got a nice taste and, you know, maybe we'll have you back sometime and at least you and I will be talking more, <laughs> but um, uh, we'll, we'll sign up here pretty soon. Now, of course, is a good time. Uh, we can share your website. I'll, I'll, I'll get the link here and I'll put it in the chat so people can jump on there. Um, social media, do you do that? Anything else you'd like to direct people to or, or share with them? Well, we roll got, uh, Prosper Pianos is the Instagram handle. It's also the Twitter handle. It's also my YouTube handle. A big thing that you'll notice here at the store is we're doing, yeah, a lot of product videos. It's mainly me playing the pianos. Um, one thing I will mention that didn't come up, but a big part of my store and my brand identity is sort of this aesthetic that I've developed that some of you might notice. I shoot all of my photos on a vintage Mamiya RB67 medium format film camera, as well as a Polaroid SX70 camera. And I guess the reason why I'm sharing this is two things. I'm passionate about photography and I found a way to inject it into my business, which is, I think, key, finding ways to inject yourself into your business your interests your personality and yeah it's sort of i discovered when i took photos of these pianos this way everybody started noticing literally no one in new york city is taking this much time to take beautiful photos of their pianos and i can tell you much like how the salesperson allows you to have the budget to continue rebuilding your pianos what clients see on the internet and what they see on social media is their first impression of you. And I advocate and strongly advise all of you to put your best foot forward. You're not a photographer, great, hire one. Invest money into people around you that can help bolster your image, your business, um, and your first presence, your first contact with clients. Anyway, I know what, yeah, we could probably talk forever, but just <laughs> want to kind of sprinkle that in for those interested. Awesome. Um, Appreciate that. Um, all right. So we I put some links in the chat there uh, to your website, Instagram and Facebook. I picked those up pretty quick so people can check those out. Um, thank you so much for joining us. I'll do our outro here and we'll, we'll, we'll sign off. Um, we have reached the end of another musical journey here at Piano Tech Radio Hour. Uh, thank you, Isak, for joining us today. As always, we're brought to you by Piano Technicians Masterclasses, cutting-edge instruction for piano industry masters without leaving your home. For those of you that joined us today by signing up for this session individually, you can make your life more convenient. You could subscribe to Piano Tech Radio Hour, just $16 a month. You can also get the recording of today's session in a member area, as well as automatic registration for each week's new session. You can sign up at bit.ly forward slash join PTRH, bit.ly forward slash join PTRH. And uh, that will be it for today's session. Thank you so much, Isak, for joining us. It's been a pleasure. And I look forward to spending more time with you soon. Likewise. See you later. Ethan. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. See you all later. Thank you so much for giving us an hour of your time. Remember that you can catch us live online every Saturday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. That's right. Go to pianotechradio.com to register so you can interact live and ask questions of our guests. See you next week.